Friday, and we've all now loosened up a little bit. We thought we would do a clap along for today's remote daily song. So if you're all are ready, we're going to keep it simple, but fun and just go. This is remote daily, your daily dose of inspiration. <laughs> this is remote daily, an oasis of innovation for your mind, your soul, and your heart. couple claps just claps here we go one two three this is remote daily this is remote daily <laughs> and as lisa just put it clapping to the beat and not falling off the treadmill is quite a fun Friday challenge. Lisa, steady on, as Joe put, as John put it. And uh, this is Remote Daily. I'm Felix, and here's our guest of today, the co-founder, co-creator of Refinery29, and a fellow German in New York, Philip von Boris. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. This is like the best community to be in. I've never felt more grounded for, you know, a fireside chat and just in general. Karis, can 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 you show up at 1 p.m. every day in my life, please? <laughs> it's expensive. That's all I can say. So Philip support uh, the Patreon. I'll support the Patreon. <laughs> Thank you very much for the kind words. I know that you're from a, um, a family of hosts. You're an amazing host yourself. And uh, I would like to actually start with that and taking us right into your household that you grew up in in Cologne, between very progressive and very conservative forces in, in your family, all overshadowed by your mom, if I remember correctly, who ran one of the city's hottest restaurants and clubs very close to home. Um, and, you know, a, coming home in the AM was normal for your mom, not for you. Uh, so what did you learn about creating a platform for people and a business from, from your mom's way of life when you grew up? Um, well, first of all, the, the idea of hosting anyone right now just brings up a lot of memories of having people over to your house for dinner and stuff. <laughs> I so desperately look forward to to that reality, to that future again. Um, yeah, I grew up in I grew up in Germany, much like yourself. I've lived here for 20 years, and uh, I am an only child. And my mom and both my dad have have always been in the hospitality industry. My mom now um, runs a restaurant in Cologne that um, is well known and amazing. And when I grew up, she um, she ran a, a big gathering place where people hosted parties. Everything from like a senior dance to a to a big wedding to like the VMAs. <laughs> like it would all happen there, and it was um, it was an amazing experience of of, um, of hosting and, and building a community. And um, to me, I've actually only sort of in my recent in my recent you know, life over the last few years realized how much that's that's shaped me and how sort of critical that is to me. Um, and yeah, so when I when I was memories of, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, I remember sitting in a big kitchen with, you know, hundreds of meals being prepared. Uh, and like you said, my mom coming home late at night. Um, and uh, yeah, it's sort of firmly part of my DNA and it seems like a, a shared experience between the two of us. <laughs> you... You, I mean, you went to the U.S. as so many Europeans do and have a high school exchange and then sort of fall in love and never really return home. 
And you did not only that, you went on to study a business in New York City at Columbia. And then in 2005 in the East Village, at least that's what legend says, you, your now wife, a partner and a friend, you started remote, uh, remote daily, Refinery29 <laughs> on a napkin, on a napkin in the East Village. So do you actually still have that napkin or can you tell us what was on that napkin that night? Uh, I was, it was actually, I don't have the napkin anymore, but I have a long, I have a treasure trove for paraphernalia of examples of the early days and a long list of, you know, names that we're brainstorming for the business. Yeah, but I, um, you know, I come from a history, from a family of, of a big family on my dad's side, I have 17 first cousins and, uh, you know, Germany is a place that's sort of pretty rigid, you know, everybody, uh, uh, in my family is in like one of three professions. They're, they're a doctor or they're a consultant or, uh, or a lawyer. And, you know, it's just, it's German to be sort of, there's a, there's a rigidity. Um, although this, this podcast reminds me of the beauty of a different Germany. Um, <laughs> so um, so I, I came to the U.S. and I always knew that I wanted to come to the U.S. from an early age. In some respects, I, I, looking back to it, I almost felt like it was supposed to be my place of birth. And I was just born in a different country. So I found my way there eventually. And I found my way there when I was 15 as a foreign exchange student. And I never looked back. Um, and it was also something about coming to the U.S. that really actually was critical to me in, in, in sort of connecting with my own creativity in a, in a meaningful way. Um, which wasn't part of my upbringing in Germany. And, uh, you know, I went to New York, I studied at Columbia, um, and I noticed a lot of people starting their own businesses and, uh, you know, going to music, going to fashion. I actually went to DC for a couple of years where I started my career working in, in digital media um, for an international affairs startup. But I really, I, I didn't love DC. I didn't love the sort of single-minded obsession with just one, you know, one thing um and i came back to new york because i realized that there was this 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 emergence of all of these independent businesses springing up um you know particularly in in and around fashion in and around style and I, you tend to see the world moving through these cycles where things get sucked up and aggregated into these big places and then people sort of send, lose their sense of individuality and they seek out um you know things that are much smaller that are more uh, independently curated. And our idea was to build a platform for that. The odds were this time, we just had Sherry Huss, the co-founder of Maker Fair uh, on Remote Daily the other day. It was the time of the makers. When you were in New York, this was the time Etsy was being born and 3D printing was being born in New York. And you you saw that and you created a platform uh, uh, for that that then turned into you know, a, a global audience footprint of, of uh, 250 million people across all platforms focus on, on women. And, um, you know, there's quite a story there because as it goes with like the successful startups, they say, yeah, we started on a napkin and then 15 years later, we sold it for 400 yeah, million. No. All these sort of founded to sold stories lack the in-between, the, the, the tears, the, the, the nitty gritty, the sleepless nights, the crises. Um, why, why is it so hard to, for entrepreneurs to talk about how it's really like to, to, to start a company and, and, and run a business and keep it afloat? Why is it always that there seems to be found it sold and um, all the heavy stuff that's in between, nobody really wants to talk about? I think there is, uh, there's so many reasons for that. One, by the way, is another German reason. I think Germans are, tend to be a little bit more introspective and actually like want to talk about their problems a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's something that you know in the u.s you 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 lead with a certain sense of optimism and that actually is a key part of startup culture of silicon valley i actually love that too but i'm obviously i would say obviously don't love not sharing the hardship um i think people have a hard time being vulnerable you know silicon valley startup world tends to be a male dominated world, the percentage of women in Silicon Valley is still after, you know, 10 years, ridiculously small, I think something like less than 2% of funding went into female founded um, startups. And I think there's just a there's a male thing too about having a harder time with, you know, with being open about, you know, what's tough and being vulnerable. So, um, and then there's, there's, there's a lot of rah, 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 that's just <laughs> unnecessary. And uh, for anyone who's ever built a business, you know, what you realize is, first of all, they've done it for way longer than you ever knew. 
when you meet a cool new business, you're like, oh, I'm sure they launched a couple of years ago and you found out they've been doing it for 10 years and there's five where you had no idea that they existed and they barely got by. So I think it would be good to actually have a forum and a, and a platform to, to talk more openly about all of those things. Um, it definitely is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's missing. I don't know how, you, how if you see it the same way and if people, you know, on, uh, on the call field, the same way about it. Yeah, it reminds me of our guest, Joaquin Roca, who was here a couple of weeks ago, who has worked on a new startup called Minerva. And the topic of our conversation was how to work on an overnight, how I worked on an overnight success for 20 years. Right. And there is this, there is this to it that you, that you say, but hey, take us in the, in the room where it happened, please. Because end of 2019, um, something, a paper was signed and $400 million uh, changed Refinery29 moved Refinery29 into a new home under the umbrella of, of Vice Media. Would you mind describing that moment with vulnerability? Share openly with us that how that was for you or maybe a moment in that moment that you remember most intensely. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the process of building a business is incredibly exhausting. Um, and the process of, you know, eventually exiting a business is also inc incredibly exhausting. And, takes a long period of time. There's so many question marks. There's so many questions that get tossed to you from all sides and you constantly, you know, are sitting on the edge of your seat, um, imagining that it's not going to happen for whatever reason, something on your side, you're not feeling right about something on the other side. So when it actually comes to pass and you sign the ink, honestly, I think on, on this going with the flow of this very grounded conversation and the theme of vulnerability, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that you sort of feel like you're like, Signing away your life, <laughs> you know, it's something that you've built and that's been yours. And I think for anyone who's an entrepreneur, you're in charge. Like that's the your builder. This is your creation. I mean, I, um, you know, it's it, it's not you know it's not your child because now I have a real child and I know how much more significant that is, um, which I didn't have then. Um, but <laughs> it's, it's it comes right after. And, uh, and so that's a, that's a big feeling. So there isn't actually sort of a first thing of exuberance. There's actually sort of a first thing of like, you know, like there's a, there's a little bit of a heavy sound feeling of like, oh my God, this just happened. Um, and, uh, and it stays with you, like any relationship and anything that, you know, that you've had in your life, that you've been with someone for a long time. So um, yeah, I think the, the room where, the room where it happened was like, oh my God, this, this just happened. And when you put ink on paper, you know, on page number 35 of the documents that you need to sign, it sort of, it sort of settled in. When you look at the Refinery29 website today, um, the featured stories on top of the page, the majority of people picture a black woman. Um, the new editor in chief is a black woman who came in after a conflict broke out as as a white guy uh, from Europe, what did you learn about the future of media through last year, through this lens of multiple pandemics, but especially the, yeah, the racism pandemic that really came to shine and was really sort of like right there for everybody to look at in 2020. What did you, what did you learn about your own profession, about media? last year? But well, it's a big question. Um, well, there was a huge racial reckoning for, for a lot of companies. And there was a huge reckoning, uh, and especially huge racial reckoning for a lot of companies last year, um, including for Refinery29. Um, and even though I wasn't there anymore, you know, it was a huge learning from myself. And honestly, I've spent months since then reflecting and, and reading and working to, to educate myself and you know, so the people who step forward, and it's not easy to step forward, right? Because often you feel sort of personal risk to yourself. Um, I'm incredibly grateful because it's, you know, creating change. You know, Refinery hired um, a black editor in chief. Um, the company became a much more sophisticated company when it comes to, when it came to, when it comes to topics of diversity and inclusion. And for myself, honestly, I wish we'd recognize a lot of these, you know, problems sooner and, and, and address them. Um, but we're really focused on building an incredibly inclusive approach to covering a lot of topics, but um, I don't think enough focus was put on creating an environment that really you know, fosters inclusivity. Um, so, you know, another learning of course is that, you know, 
the diversity and inclusion are very different. You know, we at Refinery 29 and many companies, honestly, at the highest level, there's just a, in, at the highest level, there's a big lack of, of diversity, but there's also a real issue with people not feeling included, not feeling like they belong. And I think that's where probably my, you know, my biggest, my biggest overall learnings were, you know, as a, as a, as a white guy, as a white guy from Europe, you just realize as you go through that process, you know, the amount, and I think this is the reckoning that, you know, that a lot of people had last year, but certainly for myself, that you have just a ton of blind spots that you didn't see before. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm working on something new again right now, you know, the focus that I'm placing on building a very diverse team from day one is very different than, than when, you know, I started 15 years ago. And what are you working on, Philip? What is your own future of media looking like at the moment? So it's it's fascinating. I was, you know, taking some time off and spent a lot of the pandemic in Maine, actually. It's where my wife is from. And I had a one and a half year old at the time for the first time in my life. And I uh, I basically went on 75 days of consecutive hikes carrying my daughter on my back, um, which I think now in retrospect is probably one of the most beautiful times in my entire life. Um, and I was spending a lot of time with entrepreneurs and I met this guy who, who uh, has built a company called Red Ventures, which is a very large company that a lot of people haven't heard um, of. And I really loved his long-term vision and I consulted on a project with, with him. And he approached me and he said, hey, what do you think about finding a way of doing something together? I you know, want to bring entrepreneurs in and uh, uh, the company looks at big consumer categories and the one that he approached me about was travel and he said what do you think about going to buy lonely planet together and uh and lonely planet and my eyes lit up i don't know how many people know lonely planet on the call i've been imagined quite a bit it's a brand that a lot of people have a soft spot for and love 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 um but it sort of hasn't kept up with the with the with the digital era and uh and so I said, you know, it'd be nothing better. And I, I, I joined him on this endeavor and I'm now an entrepreneur in residence and head of Lonely Planet and thinking about the revival of a great travel brand that is iconic and also what the future of travel will look like in a post COVID world. Because the interesting thing about the travel industry is that it's actually the industry that's been hit the hardest by COVID of all. Um, but it's also the industry that we have the least information about yet of what will be different. Everybody just knows that travel is going to blow up. People are dying to go explore the world again. But I think it's going to look very differently. And people's imagination hasn't played out yet to determine what that will be. I, I can't believe this. So you didn't only take on the future of media, which is hard enough. You also took on the future of travel, which is even harder. Uh, it, but did I, did I understand that correctly just to ask because I was so taken away by the name Lonely Planet because it took me to places. You, did you buy the Lonely Planet? So Red Ventures, the, the company that um, that I'm now a part of, bought Lonely Planet. So I okay. didn't personally buy Lonely Planet, um, but I'm an entrepreneur in residence and now head of Lonely Planet, effectively CEO of Lonely Planet, Jesus. trying to bring this iconic brand back together. <laughs> this is L Lonely Planet glitter just for you <laughs> from all our travelers I'm, out I'm, here. I'm loving the supportive vibes in this room. This is like the best group ever. It's really yes, good. Yes, it is. It's really I want to hear you some, all. You Please, feel, let's, you let's hear it. Special. Let's hear it for Philip. Hey, <laughs> for Philip. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Thank you, Errol. And uh, Philip, I mean, this is incredibly exciting. Uh, I wonder, however, I mean, when I think about Lonely Planet, I think about the part of my bookshelf that is blue, that is I'm most proud of, especially the ones that are like, where the paper looks really used and there's a lot of little post-its and coffee pages stains. have been ripped out, coffee stains. There's like, don't go into this hostel is like written across a page. And um, I wonder, because we're in a time of incredible loneliness, there is a health pandemic, there is a racism pandemic, uh, and there's a, a mental health pandemic that we haven't even really gotten to. And I think loneliness is part of the reason why people sign up for crazy movements right now, uh, for movements that have no substantial base because they all want to belong somewhere and there's just nothing there. 
And to me, Lonely Planet is actually a brand I totally want to belong to. And I wanted to be a part of for years while, you know, traveling was everything. I, I spent all my savings and everything I, I made through work on, on travel. So how do you make sure that people will feel belonging again to Lonely Planet? How do you, what is your, maybe you have some first ideas that you can share with us, how you want to do that? Well, there's so much, so much to unpack in your question. I mean, Lon Lonely Planet is a brand that has to sort of find find its its its, its digital identity and, and build trust again. It also needs to become an inclusive brand because travel is actually the most whitewashed industry of all. It traditionally has been about you know white people sitting in London, New York, and Sydney and traveling to, I don't know, Nigeria and tell you what to do in Lagos. It's like the you know it's, it's silly the way it's been. Um, but I think about this moment of belonging, I think you're totally right. Um, it's funny, my wife, Kara, who's a co-founder of Refinery29 um, and then a creative genius and, and honestly led most of the, the amazing ideas and big concepts that we created. But she launched this thing called Dancercism three months ago and she became a, uh, basically a dance instructor. And she does this thing for people who, who are not like health nuts, but who wanna be, uh, you know, who wanna be fun, creative, who, who wanna have exercise, um, but also connect with their, with their mindfulness and spirituality. And I think it's sort of like even this setting, I think it's about people connecting with themselves and, and finding a way for personal growth and, and, and spirituality. I know early in the, in the chat here, I think, um, was it uh, Ky Kyoko um, uh, mentioned like, you know, like, like platforms for, for coming together. I think the social learning space, I think there's there's definitely a need for people wanting to to come together. And a lot of businesses will be built in that space. Um, so it's um it's it's really interesting. I think right now it's definitely the February blues for a lot of people who are living in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> there's it's definitely the desire to be at a dinner party or uh, just be surrounded by people. Um, so I think there's going to be a hybrid. There's going to be a lot of people returning, dying to return back into the real world. It's probably a great time to start a nightclub in New York right now. You're going to make more money than you've ever made before. <laughs> Another thing there's also going that, to be some extension yeah. of that that lives on in the digital yeah. in the digital space and in this hybrid in this hybrid way that I think will be really powerful. And I just want to quote Kyoko again. I think the future of media is about formats to foster connection. Uh, and how we stay connected. We're social beings and need connection regardless. And I think the ways of communication now are endless, but the ways of to actually connect, they're, they're pretty limited. And I'm so excited for you to take this on, Philip. I would like to get three quick thumbs up, thumbs down from you on new media platforms that are emerging. Uh, first of all, Clubhouse, yay or nay? I mean, you can't you can't argue with the growth of the platform. So I guess it's a thumbs up. It's it's I don't know if it's a platform for me. I don't know if it, I've connected with it properly yet. Um, mm -hmm. Something about feels a little not inclusive. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know. But from a business perspective, definitely thumbs up. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's a playground for VC. So for from you, thumbs up. Fortnite. John put it in the chat already. When I think about Lonely Planet and traveling. This is what people do right now on Fortnite. So what, what about Fortnite as a media platform? I mean, clearly thumbs up, although I wish I had a teenager at home that was really gonna you know, take <laughs> me through Fortnite because I just understand it like far too little. Do you feel like, are you spending time on, on Fortnite, Felix? I just, so my daughter just, the older one just discovered Minecraft for the first time. I, I downloaded the app for her and let her play around with it, um, you know, <laughs> It's that's my first like foray into this world of sort of like reality online social gaming. And what I heard from people here in this community is, well, if your friends are on Fortnite or on, you know, whatever online platform it is and they game with you there and you hang out there, then this is your social space. It, and, and it's and it's a good space if you meet your friends there. So, you know, I, uh, I, I find it hard to believe that a game can actually turn into this gathering space. I wasn't there for the concerts on Fortnite and, and all of that, but hey, I, I totally uh, think there is an opportunity because so many people are already there. And I, when thinking about Lonely Planet, you know, could you, could you bring people um, from a gaming world into the world of travel and show them like, you know, how Venice or how 
um, the Outback yeah. in Australia looks like on Fortnite, probably you can. Oh, a hundred percent. This virtual opportunity is going to be big. Um, I do also believe that there, I hope, and I strongly believe that the real world is just going to have a massive resurgence as well, though, because, you know, it's not all going to happen through, through virtual gatherings. People will want to be in shared spaces again. Yes, but I was just uh, listening to this discussion and somebody said, an analyst said, there's going to be a huge cultural moment when this is sort of when we can go out again. And, and yes, you say, when people are, who are smart open up clubs in New York City, there's going to be a huge cultural moment when we all, you know, you said in the beginning, we have the storage full of physical experiences that we didn't have access to. But he also said, this what we the habits that we have been building over the last months and even now a year they are not going to go away there's too much that happened and too many people that realized what they can do in this space it's not going to leave us so even though there will be a cultural moment some of this will stay i think you said it already and um i'm very excited about it because i see when you talk about inclusivity i see this being more inclusive um, than any you know conference, physical conference, in, than that you that you can host or physical physical gathering. However, oh, a, last yeah. last year or nay, uh, as many people here in the room are great writers, what do you think about Substack, the new platform where so many people write newsletters and um, find subscribers and monetize on it? Yay or nay? I mean, it's brilliant. I, I, that to me goes straight back to the niche space. Um, I'm a I'm a I'm a big believer in that. Um, I mean, the fact that. What's her name? Heather Cox Richardson, the person who's making, who's the number one Substack writer, is you know, who is a professor at Boston College, is making millions of dollars uh, producing her daily newsletter. Um, I mean, it's incredible. Eventually, all the stuff will have to be pulled together again. Um, that's the that's the thing that's really interesting because if you realize that in some respect, search now as a as a thing on the internet is almost broken. Um, so some, some platform will emerge that is going to re-aggregate it all. And as a last question to you, Philip, uh, Philip, when you look at, you know, your own media consumption right now and what you enjoy using, following, subscribing to, is there one, maybe a Substack newsletter or another platform, an app, uh, an account that you follow something, of course, next to refinery nine that you recommend to, to, to subscribe to, to follow, to understand someone who's trying to build the future of media. I came across this thing that, uh, that I really love. It's called the Cappuccino app, um, where you basically with a group of friends can record a 90 second daily bean as a daily podcast. And then you can hear and share your like podcast in your social circle. Um, huh. I, I have loved doing that. It was really, really, really great. And during the pandemic, I've had this text chain with you know, 15 friends that I've stayed more connected with than ever before, as a lot of people have, and we did it. Um, and it was um, it's really, really, really an amazing way to experience other people's you know, lives through a, different, through a different reality, sound, which you don't usually do. The Cappuccino app and so many other recommendations from the co-founder of Refinery29, Philip von Boris. Wow, I'm... I'm